I have a confession I need to make to you this morning. A rather embarrassing fact that I have never admitted publicly. I am a barbarian. I know this may not come as a shock to some of you who know me, but I want to be clear. I'm not a metaphorical barbarian. It's not a description of the way I eat or drink, my hygiene, grooming habits or lack thereof, love of nature or warlike sensibilities. I'm afraid it's genetic. I have barbarian DNA. And the only reason that people don't see me as a barbarian is because my barbarous genes have been obscured by thousands of years of history in which my ancestors came to join what scholars call civilization. But I am the descendant of barbarians nonetheless. It is who I am, and I need to own it. Some of you may be barbarians as well and not even realize it. My people and some of your people sacked the ancient city of Rome in 387 B.C., conquered its armies, destroyed its buildings, and burned the city to the ground. In 279, we attacked the religious and political center of Greek civilization, Apollo at Delphi, but we were defeated at the Battle of Thermopylae, and our survivors crossed the Aegean Sea and settled in a little place in Asia Minor, what is today east of Turkey. Barbarian is the derogatory name that the Romans gave us, but they also called our people Gauls, and the place our survivors settled was known as Galatia. We didn't refer to ourselves as Gauls or Galatians, just as Native Americans did not call themselves Indians. And that's because we were an alliance of many different tribes, Celts, Germani, Franks, and Britons. The Romans used the term Gaul or Galatian as an umbrella for anyone north of the Alps. In 58 BC, our tribes united again to fight against Rome in what is known as the Gallic Wars, and we were defeated again by Julius Caesar and his armies, who subdued all the territory from the Alps to the British Isles and employed this newfound power that Caesar had to transform Rome from a republic into an empire. Two million of our people were killed. A million were enslaved. But even more humiliating, the image of our deaths became enshrined in stone for all time, statues of dying Gauls, slain Galatians, became the quintessential representation of Roman imperial power and supremacy. Visually, we occupy the Roman imagination as the archetypal enemy, barbarian intruders, who were then destroyed. Freezes of our brutal and Awful deaths were the favorite subject of an entire genre of victory art, conveying a single message to the entire world, the inevitability of unconditional surrender to the Roman Empire. Every Galatian living after the Gaelic Wars would have seen these images of vanquished and dying relatives emblazoned on the walls of every city as a form of imperial Roman propaganda. It must have been a lot like being a Native American in this country, and watching a Western. And growing up in church, I had no idea that Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians to my barbarian ancestors. I had never heard anything about the Gauls from Sunday school teachers or pastors who offered lessons on Paul's epistles. I just thought Galatia was another one of those cities in Asia Minor that Paul visited. As a young Protestant growing up, all I'd ever heard was Luther's interpretation of Galatians, which was the bedrock of the Reformation's famous justification by faith doctrine. Luther transformed Paul's letter into the Magna Carta of a new and narrow understanding of salvation that cemented anti-Jewish theology and completely obscured the history of the Galatian people and their reality as scapegoats of Roman oppression. Luther made Paul's letter into a tool of division, drawing firm battle lines 
between faith in Christ and Jewish law. And a superior Christian Protestant self was opposed to an inferior other that encompassed not only Jews but also Catholics and Muslims for Luther and all socio-religious movements from below like fanatical sectarians known as the Anabaptists. The Protestant was right and all others were wrong. The Protestant was good, all others bad. The Protestant was righteous, all others evil. By using Paul's letter to create a Jewish other, Luther ironically did exactly what the Romans had done to the Galatians. He turned Paul's language of justification by faith into a polemical treatise against an imagined enemy of the faith, which allowed the epistle to the Galatians to be reabsorbed into that older pre-Christian pattern of Roman imperial self-justification over and against the non-Christian other. This letter that Paul originally wrote to a community of barbarians who were vanquished and oppressed by the Roman Empire was morphed into a toxic theology and divisive faith employed all over again to vanquish and oppress new groups of human beings, especially the Jewish people. From barbarians to Jews to savages to terrorists, we continue to do this to people. We rehearse this ancient pattern again and again. We label people. We name and defame. We otherize. We use derogatory and dehumanizing terms to categorize and denigrate entire groups of human beings. Why? Is it because we think Paul did that? There's a lot of bad theology that we can lay at the feet of the Apostle Paul, but often his words are and were misinterpreted by figures like Luther to justify Christian supremacy and oppression and violence. For most Christians today, the only Paul that we have is the one that Luther gave us. And we can't seem to get away from Luther's interpretation of Paul no matter how hard we try, which is why it's no surprise that much of what goes for Christianity in America today often sounds like Paul, but in practice looks a lot more like Luther. Scholar Neil Elliott claims the usefulness of Paul's letters to systems of domination and oppression is clear and palpable. Paul has been made an instrument in the legitimization and of oppression in our world. He has been pressed into the service of death. Eliot says. It reminds me of Howard Thurman's grandmother, who was raised on a plantation near Madison, Florida. The Thurman would read the Bible to her two or three times a week, but she was very picky about the portions that she wanted to hear. Psalms were a must. Isaiah was welcome. So were the Gospels, but never Paul. After years of reading her favorite passages to her over and again, Thurman finally mustered the temerity to ask his grandmother about her choices, especially why she shunned anything by Paul. And he would never forget what she said. During the days of slavery, his grandmother replied, the master would hold services for the slaves. An old man, McGee, was so mean he would not let a black minister preach. And the white minister always, always used something from Paul. And at least three or four times a year, he used this, the same text, slaves be obedient to your masters as to Christ. And then he would go on to claim that it was God's will that we were slaves, and if we were happy and good slaves, God would bless us. And so, Thurman's grandmother said, I made a promise to my maker that if I ever learned to read and if freedom ever came, I would not read that part of the Bible ever again. We all have our reasons for not reading Paul. The way men used his patriarchal words about the role of women in the household and church or how homophobic people wildly misinterpreted his teachings to condemn LGBTQ people or the way racists used his letters to justify the institution of slavery, white supremacy, and many other forms of evil. But is it not possible that there is another Paul a more liberatory Paul? And is there a way to recover Paul from the ash heap of Protestant theology and evangelical history? 
For God's sake, Paul is the one who said in our scripture today, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Have we forgotten that Paul was imprisoned by the Roman Empire? According to Acts, he caused riots in Jerusalem, an uprising in Thessalonica, and had to be snuck out of Berea in the middle of the night. He was considered an enemy of the state who was eventually arrested and executed. He wrote four letters from prison. Why did the Roman Empire kill Paul? They did not do that to every sectarian Jewish leader. There were plenty of religious leaders at the time who believed all sorts of things that differed from imperial ideology, yet those individuals did not get hung on crosses or have their heads chopped off. So what was it about Paul that led the state to crucify him? There we may find the real apostle. In her book, Galatians Reimagined, Reading with the Eyes of the Vanquished, scholar Bridget Call argues that in the letter to the Galatians, Paul was not setting up a polemic of faith versus law to divide followers of Jesus from the Judaizers or the Jewish people. Instead, she claims Paul was aligning himself as a follower of the crucified Jesus with the crucified people of the empire, the vanquished barbarian Gauls, and trying to distinguish life in the spirit from the law of the Roman Empire. The Gauls were not just archetypal enemies of Rome, but representatives of lawlessness and impiety. However, the Galatians were now, in, in this book, submitting themselves to the laws of Judaism around circumcision, which was also a way of submitting to the law of Rome. Because of long-standing treaties, the Jewish people were permitted to worship their own God and did not have to participate in Roman imperial worship or cultic practices. However, it was a massive scandal for a non-Jewish person, for instance, a be Greek believer in Jesus, to not participate in Roman worship or cultic practices, to refrain from worshiping the empire or the gods of Rome. They would have been accused of lawlessness, impiety, treason, and maybe even arrested and crucified. So to avoid these consequences, Jewish followers of Jesus in Galatia were demanding that their fellow Gentile followers be circumcised so that they would be considered as Jews and by extension live in good standing with the laws of Rome. This act of accommodation to Roman law made Paul furious. He was angrier with the Galatians than in any other letter. He did not write a proper introduction or an effusive greeting. Instead, he lambasted the Galatians from the outset. I am astonished, he said, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. In chapter 3, he said, you stupid Galatians, who bewitched you? And he even said, I wish those who unsettle you would castrate themselves. We must admit, this was not the most pastoral letter that was ever written <laughs> in the history but why was Paul so upset? It was not simply the imposition of circumcision or following Jewish law. No, Paul believed the barbarian Gauls, the Galatians, were accommodating to the Roman Empire, nullifying their faith in Christ. They were allowing the empire to define their relationships between one another in the church. And Paul was adamant that they should not allow the Romans to define who the followers of Jesus are on Rome's terms. Therefore, he insisted that they relate to each other on Christ's terms and not the empire's. There is no longer Jew or Greek, he famously proclaimed, no longer slave or free, no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ. The stupid Galatians were not in danger of backsliding into Jewishness, but into the tyranny of the empire, a danger we all face when we allow imperial structures to organize the way we see each other, allowing the empire to define our relationships to each other assures that they will be violent, because violence is the essence of empire. So we must find a different way to see each other, to relate to each other. Throughout our history, the American empire has operated the same way the Roman empire did. 
using epithets and laws to label people, to name and defame individuals, to otherize human beings with derogatory terms that categorize and compartmentalize and dehumanize entire groups of human beings. The empire has used terms like savages, Indians, pagans, slaves, immigrants, colored, communists, terrorists, as modern-day versions of Rome's barbarians. It is, of course, now the height of irony that people like me, who the Romans would have called barbarians for most of history, have become the new Romans, calling everyone who does not look like us barbarians. The crucified of history have become the crucifiers. One could easily argue that the Romans and the Americans are the real barbarians in the story, but that's not the point of Paul's letter to the Galatians, is it? Paul's point, and the one we must cling to as followers of Jesus, is this extraordinary gospel truth. There are no barbarians. As Paul said to the letter to the Colossians, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, and then he got specific. There is no barbarian or Scythian slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. There are no barbarians. I'm not sure if you heard that. There are no barbarians. You are not a barbarian. I am not a barbarian. There are no barbarians. Yes, I am the descendant of barbarians, but in Christ there are no barbarians. There are no savages, there are no Indians, there are no pagans or slaves or immigrants or colored or communists or terrorists, only beloved human beings made in the image of God. And proclaiming this in the first century in Rome or in 21st century America is a revolutionary statement that could get someone killed. This is the liberatory Paul that I'm desperate for all of us to see. The, for American Christians to embrace the radical and revolutionary Paul who rejected every Roman epithet that was ever used against people, stood against every imperial law of oppression and violence, and proclaimed once and for all that the Spirit of Christ had set every single one of us free. Free from every form of derogatory characterization, denigration, slavery, and evil. Free. Do you believe it? I want all of us to hear the Paul who talked about love more than all the other authors in the Bible combined. Have we forgotten that? The Paul who said the only thing that counts is love. That the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, love your neighbor. If you are led by the Spirit, Paul said, then you are not subject to the law, any law. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, Paul said. There is no law against love. No law against joy. No law against peace. No law against patience or kindness. No law against generosity, faithfulness, or self-control. And as people who follow Jesus and this Paul who were both executed by the law. We are not required to subject ourselves to any laws that are not loving or joy-inducing or peacemaking. If we are led by the Spirit, we are not subject to the law, whether Roman or American, any law that would harm or oppress our neighbors, which is why, as people of faith, we are called from time to time to transgress any law that has been proposed or passed or enforced that seeks to oppress the poor, people of color, women, or the LGBTQ community. We have been called to freedom as brothers and sisters, male and female, Jew and Greek, barbarian and Scythian, slave and free, young and old, black, white, rich, poor. All of us have been called to freedom. This means we must stand against anything that would enslave us or our neighbors, whether it be laws or Supreme Court rulings or debt or the criminal justice system, racial identity, nationality, religion, or even God. As James Baldwin said, if the concept of God has any validity or use, it can only be 
to make us larger, freer, and more loving. And if God cannot do this, then it is time we got rid of him. There are a lot of people in our country who seem content to worship a small and slavish and hate-filled God. Some of these who claim to be followers of Jesus are using and misusing the old Baptist concept of religious freedom as a license to discriminate against the marginalized and to attempt to enslave everyone to their twisted vision of a Christian society. But we know it has nothing to do with religious liberty, but is actually an attempt to make us enchained to an extreme ideology. Paul was quite clear with the Galatians, just as he would be with hypocritical proponents of religious liberty, and to us that our freedom should not be used as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but for love and the building of beloved community. Yes, we are free from imperial categories and laws of oppression and violence, practices of calling people names that tear down and dehumanize and destroy. We're free from that, but we're also meant to be free for. We are not meant just to be free from oppression and harm. We are meant to be free for love and for community. If we only care about what we've been freed from and don't take seriously what we've been freed for, our freedom, as Paul warns us, will become nothing more than an individualistic libertarian nightmare filled with competing forms of violence. In her book, See No Stranger, a memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love, Valerie Kaur writes, love is more than a feeling. Love is a form of sweet labor, fierce, bloody, imperfect, and life-giving, a choice we make over and over again. She says, love can be taught, modeled, and practiced. This labor engages all of our emotions. Joy is the gift of love. She says, grief is the price of love. Anger protects what is loved. And when we think we've reached our limit, wonder is the act that returns us to love. When we choose to wonder, to be curious about people we don't know, when we imagine their lives and listen to their stories, we begin to expand the circle of those that we see as a part of us. We prepare ourselves in curiosity and wonder to love beyond what evolution requires. We prepare ourselves to say, you are a part of me I just don't know yet. You are a part of me I just don't know yet. True freedom begins when we turn toward each other in revolutionary love and begin that practice of wonder. I wonder, what was the true Paul really like, unobscured by Luther? I wonder what he was really calling the Galatians to be when he called them into freedom. I wonder what life would be like if there were no empires or if we all stood against them. I wonder what life would be like if we lived like there are no barbarians. I wonder what freedom could possibly mean for us. I wonder what life in the spirit might feel like. I wonder what our community would be. I wonder what our church would be. And I wonder what America would be if we truly believe that all people are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights among these life and liberty, the pursuit of happiness. I wonder, I wonder what our world would be if we stopped scapegoating people, if we truly believed in freedom, and if we really live the gospel truth, there is no law against love. May we move from wonder and from worship into the work of joy and peace. Amen.